Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'd like to introduce Michael Swift, Mike Swift, who is here. He is interviewing um, in my group for a full-time full researcher position. Uh, Mike's got a very fascinating history. He actually spent eight years in the Windows organization, so he knows all the pain about actually shipping real products. Although I only really ship one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's pretty good, actually, the way things have been going. <laughs> anyway, um, and he's he's... Doing his, finishing his PhD at the University of Washington. So I'll just turn the time over to him. Great, great. Thanks. Thank you all for coming, um, and thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about my research, which has been on how to improve the reliability of commodity operating systems. And really, what I mean is how to stop operating systems such as Linux, Windows, Mac OS from crashing quite as often. Probably something that people here have thought about quite a bit as well. Now, before I get into the meat of my talk, I want to sort of set some context for how my work fits into the larger body of operating systems research. Is most people here know a lot about operating systems research, so it'll be old hat. But at a high level, as I see it, there are sort of three major problems in operating systems people have been working on for 30 or 40 years. Um, and one of these is performance. How do we actually give applications access to the raw underlying power that the, the hardware provides? And people here look at things such as avoiding unnecessary operations, such as data copying, um, building better abstractions, or programming interfaces so you don't need to make as many calls into the operating system, um, things like that. Another thing people look at is adding features. How do we make our operating systems more useful and usable? And here again, people look at things like better ways to program them to make it easier to write applications. That's been a great strength of Microsoft, I think. Um, and also um, other kinds of features such as indexing file systems that make it easier to access your data. And the third problem people work on is reliability. How do we make sure that our operating systems are available to be used when we need to use them? Now to some extent, Moore's law has taken the pressure off performance because our computers have gotten faster, so we don't need to put quite as much work as people did in the early days into performance. Um, and it's also made room to add lots of features to make our operating systems more fun and easier to use. But it hasn't had the same impact on reliability, and hence that's the area of my research. Now I'm not the first person to look at operating systems reliability. There's been work going on in this since operating systems were first started. And at a high level, if you look at the kinds of approaches people have taken or the things that have actually been pretty successful, there's really three major things people do. One thing they do is to start with existing operating systems code and try to make it better by finding bugs and fixing bugs. So this is the approach taken by things like the uh, prefast and prefix work here, the static driver verifier. Dawson Engler's work at Stanford falls into these lines. And the idea is basically you have tools that can find bugs and then a human programmer has to go and fix the bugs. Now the downside of this is that as you have a lot of code, the cost of actually fixing the bugs can be pretty substantial. And you can probably find a lot more bugs that you can actually fix, which sort of limits the scalability of this approach as you grow to mammoth code bases. Another thing you can do is to build a whole new operating system, saying, you know what, the existing code is fundamentally not going to work for this application because it can be never, never be made reliable enough. So we need a new system built with new engineering techniques that can provide this level of reliability. And this has been done, again, many times in history. Things like the Multics operating system was designed to be highly reliable. The Hydra operating system, Tandem's nonstop. IBM's Quicksilver research operating system put transactions into the operating system to be highly reliable. And again, this approach has been very successful. But the problem is that it's a very expensive approach, both in terms of dollars to create a new operating system and in terms of performance when you're actually running these new operating systems. And so these approaches haven't had a great amount of impact on commodity operating systems yet, where price and performance are very important. The third thing people do is to add hardware to the problem, to replicate the operating system on multiple computers. So that if it fails on one computer, it's still running on other computers. This is done, for example, in the Google cluster, or I'm sure the MSN cluster, where you have lots of computers running. And if one fails, well, there's lots of other places to pick up the slack. Now, this, again, is very successful, but it really hasn't had a big impact on other kinds of computing, such as personal computing. You know, I don't walk around with three laptops to handle the case where my laptop fails in the middle of a presentation. So we need another approach to solve this kind of problem. And this is what my work is about. It's another way that doesn't require fixing the code. It doesn't require writing a new operating system. and doesn't require adding hardware, and yet can make the operating system more reliable. The approach that I take is to add a new subsystem into the operating system whose job it is is to let applications in the OS tolerate the failure of operating system components. And to understand how this works, let's talk now about how operating systems are structured and why they fail. 
So this is a picture of how operating systems are structured, or at least it's what we teach to undergraduates at universities of how operating systems are structured. At the top, you have applications. They're in a user mode, and they're isolated from one another, meaning that if they have bugs and they fail, they really only the, only the application that has bugs fail. Largely, the other applications are not impacted, and they can keep running. And the operating system as a whole generally keeps running as well. Down below, shown in blue, is the operating system kernel. And here, there is no isolation, meaning if there's a bug in one component, it can impact everything else, and it can cause the whole system to crash. Now, the kernel is structured out of a bunch of different subsystems um, that provide services to applications in the OS, such as virtual memory, filing, networking, exception handling. Now, largely, it turns out this code is pretty reliable. It's not what causes the majority of crashes. And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, it's developed by people with a lot of experience. And they generally know what they're doing, and they have pretty good practices in testing and debugging this stuff. It's also common to every installation of the computer, so it gets very, very widely tested. You know, hundreds of millions of machines run this code. And so if there are bugs in it, even if they're pretty infrequent, they can be found and they can be fixed. Now, what's missing from this picture, as you all know, is something that operating system researchers are not very comfortable talking about. If you look at the history of people doing research on operating systems, this particular component is generally left out of the papers, or it's a footnote, or it's a sentence saying, we borrowed this piece from someone else because it was too hard to deal with. And of course, that is device drivers. Uh, I'm trying to change that. <laughs> so device drivers account you know, for the majority of code that's written to run inside the kernel. It accounts for the majority of code that runs in the kernel. And it accounts for the majority of failures. We learned from the Windows group that 85% of Windows crashes are due to device drivers. Now, this is a really hard problem. You know, you've got tens of thousands of drivers out there that Microsoft doesn't control. And any one of them that you're running can cause your whole system to crash. Now, ideally, you would like this code to be perfect. And there's been a lot of work on how to make this code perfect. But I think fundamentally, given that you don't control all that code, it's hard to actually make every one of those drivers perfect and bug free. And the other problem is you don't actually even know what it means to be perfect for device drivers. Because they have to interact with hardware, you don't know what that side of the interface is. And it's very hard to say what does it mean to interact with hardware perfectly. So what we want to do here is find a way to let the operating system tolerate the failure of these device drivers without having to change any code. Because changing code is really expensive, really time consuming, and really error prone. So my solution to this is to add a new subsystem, a reliability subsystem, into the operating system. The goal of this reliability subsystem is to isolate device drivers, similar to the way applications are isolated, so that if they have bugs in them and they do fail, we can prevent the kernel and applications themselves from being corrupted. This means we can tolerate device driver failures and keep running even when they fail. So, um, oh, whoops, let me go back. So the other part of of this project is to find a way to make this work in the context of existing operating systems, um, to not require large-scale rewriting of the operating system. And so one of the benefits of this approach is that in it, beyond adding this new subsystem, the only changes that need to be made are sort of a small amount of glue code to integrate this new subsystem into an existing operating system. You don't have to rewrite large portions of the code or change things into other programming languages. So it's very compatible with existing code. So at a high level, the contributions of my research are that I designed and built a new kernel subsystem that can prevent what I think are the majority of driver-caused crashes. It can do this with no changes to existing drivers. And it requires only minor changes to the operating system to integrate this new subsystem. Furthermore, it only minimally impacts performance, meaning that it can be used in a wide variety of environments, even those that are pretty demanding from a performance perspective. So in the remainder of this talk, I now want to talk about what a driver is, why they cause so many problems. And then I'll talk about the design of my subsystem, how it works, how it's structured. And then I'll present an evaluation of how well it works in terms of what the benefits it provides and what the costs of using it are in terms of performance. And then I'll summarize and I'll talk a bit about related work and future work. Are there any questions so far? OK, let's launch into this. So first of all, what is a device driver? Should be pretty obvious to most people here. But a device driver is a module that receives requests from the operating system and translates those requests into a request that a device can understand. For example, a network device driver receives requests from the kernel to send packets and then tells a specific network card to send packets. Now, in general, every device out there has its own unique driver. Now, this isn't true across all devices, but it's the general trend of things, or it's the general way things are done. Um, and what that means is because there are tens of thousands of devices out there, there are tens of thousands of drivers. And in, even more so, individual computers can run tens to hundreds of drivers. My Mac laptop here, for example, is running 81 different device drivers that control everything from all the input and output devices, the buses, the networking, all that stuff takes a different driver. Um, now, all this code, because it has to interact with the hardware, in today's operating systems, it has to run in the kernel because talking to hardware is a privileged operation. 
to make this problem tractable of how do you run all the, how do you plug all this code into the kernel, the kernel publishes a small number of standard interfaces that driver writers can implement. By writing to the standard interface, you can then plug your driver into the existing kernel with no changes to the kernel and have it take advantage of your device and use it without needing to do anything else. Um, and this is how you can solve this problem of having, you know, lots and lots of different devi devices plug into a single existing kernel. So let's look next at why are drivers buggy um, or why do they fail? Well, to some extent, they fail because they're complex and they're hard to write. Now, this is kind of a silly answer because this is why all software fails, because all software is complex and hard to write. But I really think that drivers are worse than most software. And there's a couple reasons for this. First of all, they have to handle asynchronous events, such as interrupts. So they need to make sure they have correct synchronization code to prevent corruption of data structures. Second, they need to obey sort of a huge set of very arcane kernel programming rules about what they're allowed to do when they're allowed to do it. And in general, these rules are not actually enforced because it's too expensive to enforce <coughs> rules like this. Instead, it's the kind of rule where 99% of the time you can violate the rule and nobody cares. But 1% of the time, when the moon is blue, it actually matters and violating the rule will cause your machine to crash. This is sort of the worst possible combination um, of how to actually build reliable software is lots of rules that you can't, that aren't actually enforced. And what this leads to is lots of non-reproducible failures where you run a drive, you run along, the system may fail, you reboot, do the same thing all over again and it works the second time. And this is because there's the, these rules depend on the exact kernel environment at the time of failure or when an interrupt happened. And so you get lots of these non-reproducible transient errors that make it very difficult to debug and figure out what actually happened. Are you familiar with the Windows driver verifier? Yes. Okay, because part of the idea of that is to enforce most of those rules. Right. In fact, most of the idea of it is, and, and it's right. very effective. Do you have any data on how effective it is? Um, I do not. I mean, this is one thing I've always been interested in is sort of how much better are drivers that pass through the Windows driver verifier or the static driver verifier compared to other drivers? My seat, out seat of the pants guess is that it's, it's fairly substantial, or at least that when the, when the driver verifier was first released, the improvement in quality that happened around then was fairly substantial, mm -hmm. which is not to say that the drivers that pass it actually work, right. but, but they aren't as broken as they used right. to be. <laughs> yes. <coughs> I mean, the downside of the driver verifier is typically you have to be very careful you exercise all your code paths when you're verifying things because it's um, not a silver bullet. Yeah. But Alec? it's gonna help a lot. Could you just give an example of one of these uh, arcane rules that's yeah. not enforced but well for example, um, you know, if you touch a page of memory that is not in if you if there's certain memory that it, that you can't touch at certain privilege levels. Um, if you touch a, you know, if you are running at the wrong privilege level then you you uh, if it's not in memory at that time you get a page fault. And if it is in memory then you can access and then it goes fine. If you're under memory pressure and it gets swapped out, then you may get um, a page fault when you're not allowed to have one. Uh, or well, there's other ones, but I don't can't think of them standing up in front of such a big group. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, actually, I bet there's a big book in many of your offices that say what all these rules are. <laughs> but not in one place. At least I have a book in, I have a book in my office. Um, so, uh, fi uh, not finally, but also drivers are very difficult to test and debug. I mean, writing in the kernel environment is very challenging. It's very hard to debug things. Um, I've spent a lot of time there and, you know, I like it, but I don't think it's what most people really want to be spending their time doing. And also, because you're interacting with devices, it's hard to get devices to generate all their possible inputs. So it's hard to get really good code coverage of drivers because they have to interact with the device and you can't just sort of run it in a test harness and actually exercise everything easily. Now finally, relative to other kinds of kernel code, drivers are written by less experienced programmers. They're not written by the Windows kernel team with, you know, 10,000 years of amassed experience of writing in this environment. <laughs> They're written by some guy in the basement in Taiwan who's trying to buy chicken for dinner. Um, and so, not to disparage the skills, but um, I think in general you could say they're not written by people with quite as much experience as the rest of the code in the Windows kernel. So let's look at what can happen when a driver has a bug in it. Well, again, we have a picture of the kernel here. Suppose the driver has a bug and it crashes somehow. One thing the driver can do because it's in the kernel <coughs> is that it can return bad data to the application or directly overwrite memory in the application's address space, causing the application to fail. It can do the same thing to the kernel itself, corrupting key data structures such as page table entries or process control blocks, causing the whole, app, the whole operating system to crash. At a high level, this is what my research is about. How do you stop a buggy driver from corrupting the application or an operating system so that you can keep running when a driver fails? As I said before, my solution to this is to isolate drivers, similar to the way applications are isolated. What this means is that if a driver has a bug in it, we can be assured that 
the driver does not corrupt anything in the kernel or application, and so we can keep executing after a driver fails. Now, just detecting failure and stopping the driver is not sufficient, however, to provide reliability and availability. And the reason is that applications actually need to use drivers on occasion. So, for example, if, if my video driver crashed right now, I would still have to reboot my system because PowerPoint is pretty useless without a video driver. And so another part of this work that we need is to be able to recover after a failure. And the way that I do this is to take advantage of a property of how drivers often fail. And I said before, they often fail with non-reproducible failures or transient failures. What this means, we believe, is that lots of times we can restart a driver after failure and start using it again, and we can keep working, and the bug will not reappear. And this is how we can recover after a driver failed <coughs> um, and keep your system functioning and keep applications running. So if you happen to have a disk driver that's got a queue depth of stuff and you fail in the middle of it, you're going to lose all of the data that was all of the requests that were pending, correct? Um, we actually keep track of all the pending requests so that we can resubmit them after a failure. Um, we keep track. I'll talk a lot more about recovery later okay. in the talk. Um, we can discuss that later. Yes? Are you also going to sort of uh, drill down into what sort of drivers and in particular what a driver is in Linux versus Windows and some of the challenges across different doing this across different OSs? Um, I am not planning on talking about that. I have a group of two undergraduates working on implementing all this in Windows, so I can talk about it. Maybe we should save that to the end when I talk about everything, and then we can sort of open it up to broad-ranging questions pinning me to the wall. Um, so whoop. at a high level, the objective of my work is to eliminate all the downtime caused by drivers. And I've told you about two kinds of downtime so far. First of all, with system crashes, which we're going to tackle by isolating drivers. The second is applications that need drivers. And here we're going to tackle that by recovering drivers after a failure. And the third piece is what happens when you have an update to your driver and you want to install that update. Commonly today, for a lot of drivers, you have to reboot your system to update the driver. Um, which kind of gives you this choice when a patch comes out, do you install this patch, which you don't know how reliable it is, um, and then actually have to reboot your system now and take mandatory downtime, or do you wait until some point in the future when the existing driver crashes <coughs> and then update at that point? You don't really have a way to apply updates in a highly available way. And this part of my work is how do you update drivers online without shutting down your system or rebooting your system? And I'm not going to talk about it more today, but we can certainly um, talk about it after the talk if you're interested. So. I now want to talk about the design of my subsystem um, and in terms of how it's structured and how it works. So I built a system that I call Nooks. It's built in the standard Linux kernel. Despite having worked at Microsoft for eight years, Linux was the way to go for this project. Um, and it works with existing Linux drivers. Um, and it adds in facilities for isolation, recovery, and update. Now, ideally, the system would be 100% reliable, meaning that it could prevent every single failure caused by device drivers. In practice, though, I don't think that's practical. Um, because it may be the complexity that it takes to get to the 100% level is just too high, um, and that it's too much development effort, or it's too much runtime overhead to hit 100% level. However, reliability is one of those nice things where every bit of reliability is better. If you have a system that crashes one-tenth as often, and you crash every 10 weeks instead of every week, that's pretty good, and I think people would like that. Even if you don't get to 100%, you can still have a lot of benefit getting 90% of the way there. The approach that I take, as I said before, is compatible with existing code. What this means is that you don't have to change your drivers, you don't have to change your applications, and you don't have to change the kernel except for the small amount of integration code. No large-scale restructuring or rewriting. The way that I accomplish this is by implementing this service as a layer that sits between device drivers and the operating system kernel. This is sort of a reliability layer. Now, this layer itself is built out of components that combine together to provide isolation, recovery, and update. And there are five major components in this service. First of all is a new protection mechanism called lightweight kernel protection domains that prevent device drivers from corrupting kernel data structures. <coughs> Excuse me. Second is a new uh, control transfer mechanism that I call extension procedure call, or XPC. I would have gone with DPC or driver procedure call, but Microsoft already claimed that term, and I didn't want to confuse anybody in my talks. Um, the third component is an object table, which is, uh, keeps track of all the objects that drivers are currently using. This is used for garbage collection during, fail during recovery. There's shadow drivers, which is a mechanism for recovering after driver failure. And finally, there are wrappers that integrate all this code seamlessly into the system without having to modify the kernel or device drivers. So I now want to go into more detail on how Nooks provides isolation, meaning how does it keep drivers from crashing your system. So the problem that we're trying to solve is that a, a buggy driver can corrupt kernel data structures or application data structures and cause them to crash. This is what we're trying to prevent. Over the years, a lot of people, including Galen Hunt, have proposed moving drivers out of the kernel into user mode. 
Now this has the benefit that it's a lot easier to write code in user mode and that indeed in user mode you can't directly corrupt kernel data structures. The problem with this though is compatibility. It's very difficult to take code that was written expecting to run in the kernel that shares data with the kernel and move it out of the kernel without rewriting it. Um, and it either means doing a lot of work in sort of an integration layer or modifying the kernel in some way at high cost. The observation we can make though here is that really what we're trying to prevent is writing to kernel data structures. It's perfectly legitimate for drivers to read from kernel data structures because that doesn't cause corruption. And so my approach in tackling this problem is to let drivers run in the kernel, in the kernel address space, and just prevent them from writing to kernel data. They can still read to their heart's content. And I do this with a new protection mechanism that I call a lightweight kernel protection domain. This is an execution um, environment for drivers where they run with full kernel privilege in the kernel address space. They can use kernel pointers. They just can't write to kernel data. And we implement this using the processor's virtual memory hardware. We run the driver with a copy of the kernel page table. And in this copy, all the pages that contain kernel code and data are marked read only, and all the pages that contain driver data are marked read write. We give the driver its own private stack and its own private heap that it can work with. Um, and, what, and we also try to make sure that the kernel never reads from anything that is private to the driver. So if the driver does corrupt something, the kernel will never directly read that data, um, which is how we prevent corruption from leaking out of the driver. Yes? Stacks. Um, yeah. We have a pool of stacks for threads that are executing in the driver. Um, and we have a, a heap that sort of grows as needed for the driver to work with. Um, so the next question is, well, we have a protection environment now for drivers. How do we actually invoke the driver? And, you know, normally drivers are invoked through procedure call. What we need to do is make sure that every time the, driver, the kernel invokes the driver, that we change protection domains. That every time the driver calls into the kernel, we change back into the kernel. And I do this with what I mentioned before, uh, my technique called extension procedure call or XPC. <coughs> this is very similar to remote procedure call in distributed systems, but it's targeted at this kernel environment um, where you really only have two domains and one is a subset of the other, where the driver, the kernel has full access to everything in the driver and the driver has limited access to things in the kernel. By replacing all the procedure calls between the driver and the kernel with XPCs, we can make sure that every time the driver runs, it runs with the correct privileges. Under the covers, what an XPC does is to change the page table, change the stack, and then invoke the target function in the target domain. Now, this is actually uh, a pretty expensive operation. On the x86, changing the page table requires flushing the TLB. It takes about 500 cycles just to change the page table, and you get a lot of TLB misses afterwards. So this is something we try to minimize the cost of or minimize the frequency of by doing aggressive batching when possible. Um, and also when possible, if the driver invokes a function in the kernel where that function does not need to write to kernel data, we let it run within the driver's protection domain. So we try to not unnecessarily invoke the XTC mechanism. So you didn't say you're copying arcs. Right, that, that's the next slide. <laughs> so this is, how we, this is how we invoke the driver, but we still have to deal with the problem of how do we get data in and out of the driver. One of the things the XPC mechanism does do is it copies the argument stack, the, the arguments on the stack from the, driver, from the kernel into the driver or vice versa. So that if there's something on the stack, the driver can work with it as normal. It doesn't deal with, however, what if the driver needs, legitimately needs to write the data or pass data into the kernel? How do we handle that? Um, now we've looked at, yes? So do you have, do you have a thread pool? We or don't. We one? run you on the kernel a, thread. You have a kernel thread, you have a driver thread per kernel thread. We have a driver stack. We dynamically allocate a driver stack per kernel thread um, when the driver is invoked. We don't have a separate unit of scheduling or locus of control or whatever you want to call a thread. Um, so what happens when the driver wants to write data that the kernel can read? How do we handle that safely? Um, what we do in this system is we create a copy of kernel objects that drivers are allowed to write to. So if the kernel wants to pass an object to the driver, let the driver update it and then read those results. What we do is when the driver passes to the kernel, we'll create a copy of that object in the kernel's protection domain on its stack or heap. The driver can modify it, and then when it's done with it, we copy those changes back into the kernel. Um, and one benefit we get from this is we get sort of a transactional update, where if the driver crashes in the middle of doing some kind of update, the kernel object is totally unchanged, and so we don't need to worry about uh, inconsistent state in the kernel. What we do need to worry about, though, however, is what if you pass something to the driver and the driver holds on to it and then it passes it back to the kernel? How do we find the corresponding object at that point? What we do to solve this is we have a table that I call an object table that keeps track of all the objects the driver is currently allowed to be using. Uh, every time the driver passes a pointer to the kernel, we consult the object table to see, first of all, is this object of the right type? Does it exist? Is it in the table somewhere? Is it of the right type? And then if it is, does exist and is of the right type, <coughs> what is the pointer to the corresponding kernel object? 
Um, and so once we've determined this, we can then synchronize the changes to the kernel version and invoke a function in the kernel. In this way, we can let driver code safely modify kernel objects by doing a sort of a copy in, copy out whenever they need to do this. Now, in the case where you need to do some kind of synchronization or locking, we need to call back into the kernel to do synchronization because we can't safely just lock one copy of this object without locking the kernel or synchronizing at the same time. Fortunately, my experience has been working with drivers is that they actually do fairly little locking because the kernel often handles the locking on behalf of the drivers. At least this is true in the Linux kernel. Um, and so there's very, little, there's very few cases we found outside of file system drivers where there's a lot of shared locking between kernel data structures and driver data structures. Um, the other benefit of the object table is, well, for one benefit, as I mentioned, is that we can consult this every time the driver, the kernel's invoked to check the validity of parameters. We can check, is this object of the right type, um, and is it a live object, or what, has it been freed before it was used? Yes? How do, how do you handle objects? I mean, this is probably pretty rare with drivers, but how do you handle objects that point to other kernel objects? Thereby allowing you to sort of transitively reach uh, out. Good question. So if you were building an RPC system, you would build a marshalling tool that would transitively copy every object. And if you've ever worked in the kernel, you know everything in the kernel is linked together. So if you copy one object, you copy the entire kernel back and forth. <laughs> Before embarking on this, I spent a lot of time analyzing driver code and looking at how do they actually access kernel objects. And I discovered that, well, it's true they are given object pointers to things with lots of other pointers in it. They actually don't follow those pointers very much. And when they do follow them, they almost never write to them. And so when I copy an object, I let all the pointers in that object dangle and point to the kernel version. This is one big advantage of taking sort of a single address space approach because I don't need to marshal these pointers. I can just let them point to the kernel and the real live version is there in a read-only fashion. Um, if they do need to write to something, then I will have to copy, sort of copy the thing that it points to and update the pointer to point to that as well. And I have not seen that, I have not had to do that with drivers. I've only had to do that with file systems and a kernel web server. Yes. I was gonna ask, when that does come up, basically do you have to modify the uh, XPC trampoline for, to be specifically for that driver to say, when you copy this, also copy the following transit. The, the code for doing the copying is not generic code in a trampoline. There's actually a separate function. Well, I'll get to that next. But there's a separate fun, there's a there's a separate piece of code for each function in the interface that handles the data copying. So when this object is passed, I need to invoke a function that says, this is how we copy this kind of object, and it, we know that's to copy multiple levels. What? That stuff's all handwritten, but it's per. It's all handwritten at this point, although I think having done it by hand, I think it's something that if I was a compiler person, I could do in a compiler. But I, I'm not yet. Uh, so, so the one place this would bite you is if the driver walked through one of your objects into a kernel something that's in read only in the kernel and then tried to walk back into one of its objects because it would see the kernel yes. copy, not its yes. copy. So I spent a lot of time reading driver code and analyzing it to look at was this a safe thing to do. Um, and so of the drivers I've worked with, I'm confident this is safe. And I actually think this is analysis This is analysis you could put into a tool like a driver verifier to verify that it follows these rules. So this was a big benefit of working with Linux in an open source world where I actually had access to hundreds or thousands of drivers. And I could actually see what they do to understand these implicit protocols that are not specified um, officially but are actually sort of common practice. Uh, hundreds uh, of thousands of drivers? Hundreds or thousands. Oh. Not hundreds of thousands. I was going to say, wow. <laughs> no, no, hundreds of thousands drivers. in the back. Okay, hundreds or thousands of um, So, so. <clears throat> So, like, you're verifying something you're looking at when you make this copy into the into the kernel mode that the object's of the right form and, and has the right sorts of parameters. Now, is it still possible that something could be malformed enough that it, it has the right shape in terms of having all the right parameters and size, but still will, you know, damage the yes, amp cell? Yes, that's completely possible. So, the, error, the, param, the parameter checking that I do at this point is very simple. I basically check, are any pointers that the driver modified, do they point to valid things? Um, do they point to things the driver's supposed to know about? And are those things the right things? What I don't check, though, are sort of all, I don't check very much at all, are these pointers internally consistent? Are the scalar values legitimate values? So one example of this that I do check for, sort of one of the only ones, is the network driver, when it registers with the kernel, tells the kernel how many bytes are in an MTU for this driver, for this network. And if you pass in zero, the kernel is fine with an MTU of zero. You can imagine what happens when you send your first packet and that for loop is sitting in the kernel, walking through every, zero, every, every byte in the packet in increments of zero. Um, and so that's one check I do put in just because I ran into it in testing. Um, but it, in general, I don't do scalar checking like that. And it's something where you could definitely add lots and lots of additional code, similar to what the Windows driver verifier do, does to do lots of checking. Um, the approach I've taken now is to do a very limited set of checks and see how far that can take me. Um, because, as I said, I'm going for sort of a 
90, 99% level. Um, and I think this is the kind of thing where to get to the 100% level, you actually need to do lots more checking like this. Uh, so you need to know the size of the types of things get, yes. to be able to. So <coughs> and every time you say pointer, you pass the driver, I map that to her because, right. because that's the, probably the nastiest and most common thing that you see in, in Windows. Mm -hmm. And you really have to, I mean, to be able to figure out how big an ERP object is, and you need to know how many stack locations it has, which means you're going to have to write code that understands. You, you can't just say, you know, ERP star points at X number of bytes. Right. So do you, do you have to write, write type-specific code? Um, in the case of ERPs, you would have to write code that would be specific to the to sort of the type of driver receiving the ERP. It has a, because an ERP, is, ERP has like a pointer to a union of all kinds of things, right? Um, and so you'd have, to, you'd have to write code that could handle all those things in the union, and basically which ones you handle determine which kinds of drivers you could execute. But yeah, there's that, and there's also just the size of the ERP varies, and that's not specific per driver. That depends on how deep the stack is, so right. that can change dynamically. Right, but that I think, you can, I think you can determine that dynamically. You can't. The you, size just need, of the stack. you just need to write You just need to write code that understands yeah. that mm -hmm. if you look at a certain offset in the ERP. And the other thing that it Right, so I have undergraduates. The undergraduates who are working on this in Windows have written a lot of code to deal with ERPs. Um, and that is definitely one of the challenges, is, is how to handle ERPs, because there's such a rich data structure. Um, and and they're in every different. driver interface. Everywhere. So the other thing I was thinking about is, what do you do in drivers? You get an interrupt and you queue up a DPC, and what do you do with it? You pass in a void star. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you going to do with a void star? Well, the thing about that void star is that void star comes right back to you. The kernel does never interprets that void star, and so I can just, so use, just treat that as a, as, a, as a number. You know, it's, um, okay. So this happens in interrupt handlers in Linux. When you register an interrupt handler, you pass in a void star as a parameter to be called with, sort of a context information. And I just treat that as opaque data I don't deal with because the kernel doesn't interpret it. I only need to worry about things the kernel interprets. Any other questions? OK, so moving on, the next question is, how do we make this all transparent to the existing code? We don't want to have to actually put all this code mainline into the kernel or into drivers. So I do this using the age-old system program technique of interposition. For every function in the driver kernel interface, I implement it at a function, a wrapper, that, that has the same signature and does the XPC and the data copying. When I load a driver into the system, instead of linking against the kernel directly, I link it against these wrappers. Um, similarly, when the kernel binds to the driver by handing it function pointers, we swap those pointers out and we give it function pointers to the wrapper instead. This means that every time the kernel invokes the driver or the driver invokes the kernel, um, it goes through a wrapper and the wrapper can do the appropriate data copying in XPC. And in this way, we can take an unmodified driver, load it into the system, and run it in an isolated environment. It also has the big benefit, however, we don't need to do that. We can load a driver into the system and link it against the kernel directly and bypass all this mechanism if, for example, it's not compatible and you know that in advance, or if it's something where you have extreme performance needs and you don't want to pay the overhead of doing the XPC. So it's a very incrementally deployable system. find a huge amount of uh, access mechanisms via macros. So in Linux, what I had to do was I had to redefine macros and recompile drivers. Now in Linux, you're kind of expected every time you touch the kernel to recompile everything, so that's acceptable. Um, but that is an issue, and I think it's something we're still working on. Um, it might be that you would change the macro, you know, if, if I was envisioning building this into Windows, I would envision it would be implemented in the kernel group, and they would define the macros appropriately to work in this environment that I don't think this is a sort of a third-party solution somebody would sell as an add-on to Windows to make it more reliable. Oh, oh this is intriguing. So isn't the case that the macros ultimately just end up being procedure calls? No, so the, mm -hmm. the problem with macros, at least in Linux, is that a lot of macros look like functions, and what they are is basically wrappers around direct modification okay. of the kernel data structure. All right. So when you're updating a page table field or you're delivering a packet, it's okay. just a macro that directly modifies the kernel queue containing packets. And so we can't let that execute. We have to change it into a procedure call. Um, and the same thing happens with static inline functions. We need to make those real functions instead of static inline functions. And there's a huge amount of hand optimization in Linux to do all this stuff. Um, if, the compile, if the actual compiler was smart enough to do this stuff automatically, then you wouldn't have such a problem. Um, because you could rely on a compiler to do this work instead of human optimization everywhere that you then have to undo or redo in this kind of system. The point one is you do actually have to rebuild all the drivers. Yes. 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 You know, there's we have, uh, I think so far, we, we've, we've dealt with two or three drivers we didn't have to rebuild. They were pretty simple drivers, a beep driver, an 8042 driver, and an Endis network driver. Um, and I think in Endis, the benefit there is already written to sort of be cross-platform across Windows 95 and the NT kernel. Uh, and so I don't know overall how much of a problem these macros will be. Uh, but I do think it's, it could be an issue. 
but at the same time, compiling is a whole lot better than rewriting. Um, and it's not perfect, but it does definitely lower the barrier to adoption for certain. But you still have to get that guy in Taiwan to do it. Yes. yes. You know, I think it's something, I think it wouldn't be impossible to do this through um, sort of uh, binary writing. I think it would be challenging, but I think it wouldn't be necessarily impossible. Okay. So uh, I just told you about how Nooks provides isolation, meaning how does it keep the system from crashing <coughs> using lightweight kernel protection domains, XPC for control transfer, data copying to allow objects, kernel drivers to modify kernel objects, and wrappers to make it all transparent. And I now want to switch gears and talk about recovery in terms of how does Nooks recover after a driver fails. Now I told you before that at a high level we're going to recover by restarting the driver. Now there's two problems with this though. One is that an application may have downloaded state into the driver. If we just restart the driver, all that state gets lost. The other problem is that an application may try to invoke a driver while it's recovering. And if the driver is not available and the application gets an error, that could be bad news to the application. Because applications today are commonly written with the assumption that either drivers never fail, or if they do fail, the whole system fails. So there's no point in putting recovery code into every application to handle this. So this is sort of the problem that I'm trying to solve in recovery. And at a high level, the goals are really, first of all, to recover the driver state so after a failure it can process requests as if it had never failed. And second, to conceal the failure from applications so they're unaware that the driver failed and as a result they don't subsequently fail. Now, we tried, we looked at a lot of different approaches to how to handle this. Um, we looked at, you know, could we implement wrappers around system calls where we could sort of retry things at the system call level. This has been done in a lot of other um, systems. And I felt like the system call interface was much too broad and varied to want to do anything at that level. And what we realized when we were looking at this harder is that the interface between the operating system kernel and the drivers is actually fairly specific in terms of what a driver is supposed to do in response to a call. So for example, if you call a network driver and you say send this packet, the driver is supposed to either send that packet or hold, accept that packet and send it at some point or tell the kernel I'm not going to do it. It's not supposed to go and reconfigure itself dynamically in the middle of a call to send a packet. And so we can take advantage of this behavior to actually model a driver as a state machine. Now this is something we can do in Linux, and I haven't looked at Windows that much, but my guess is that you could do something similar in Windows. Um, and let me give you an example of how this works. So here's sort of the initial state for a network driver. It's just been loaded, it's not doing anything. We call it to send a packet, and it moves into a state where it has one packet that's outstanding, but hasn't been acknowledged yet as being sent. When the driver calls the kernel back to complete the request, we know at this point it's in a state where there's no outstanding packets. And so we can tell just from seeing the messages, the communication between the driver and the kernel, more or less what state the driver is in. Now this is a very simple state machine model, but for other drivers you may have more complex models. For example, here's a model for a connection-oriented driver, where you can open a connection, configure that connection with various parameters, um, where you may move in back and forth between states, and then close the connection when you're done with it. And so the idea is that recovery then becomes the pro uh, figuring out how do we take a driver from the initial state through some path through the state machine into the state it was in at the time of failure. So we need to record enough information while the driver is running to reconfigure the driver in this way. And second, to conceal the failure, what we're going to do is we're going to respond to requests from applications in a way that's appropriate given the state the driver is in, but that does not advance the state of the driver um, during the recovery process. So I do this with a piece of code that I call a shadow driver. Shadow driver is generic code, meaning that it's not specific to any specific device driver. Um, normally when the driver is functioning properly, it records all the inputs that change the state of the driver. When the driver fails, the shadow driver restarts the driver, it then replays the inputs to recover it into the state it was in at the time of failure, and then, it, while this is going on rather, it emulates the driver to applications in the operating system so they're unaware that the driver failed. Now we do specialize dri shadow drivers, sorry, to a class of drivers that implement the same interface. So we would have one, we have one shadow driver that handles network drivers, another shadow driver that handles sound drivers, a third shadow driver that handles storage drivers. Now one thing about this approach is that it requires that the interface to the driver be well known at the time you're writing the shadow driver. If you have a device driver that has a user mode component that can configure it in some special way that only that user mode component knows, then we can't build the state machine for it in advance. If you have a generic driver, however, that does not have any other management <coughs> components, we can do this approach. So let's look at exactly how this works. I'm going to pause here and get my backup water bottle. Um, <coughs> so, I, I had a cup, but I'm, I actually have a cold, and so I think I'm suffering. More, I'll, okay. <laughs> we'll see. I'll be the gracious host. Okay, <laughs> thanks. I need to. So we have another picture of the kernel here. It's changed a little bit because I want to look at the communication and not so much at the structure. To this picture, we add a shadow driver. Now the job of the shadow <coughs> driver is to follow, 
the device driver monitor what it's doing and be prepared to step in at a moment's notice. To do this, the shadow driver has to see all the communication between the kernel and the driver. And it does that with the mechanism that I call a tap. The tap is conceptually a T-junction that sits between the kernel and the driver. And its job is to mirror all the requests between the kernel and the driver into the shadow driver. So when the kernel would normally invoke the driver directly, that call goes to the tap. The tap then mirrors it into the shadow, and the shadow can see all the calls from the kernel into the driver. And the same thing happens in the reverse direction. Now, as I said before, when the driver is functioning normally, the shadow's job is to record all the state-changing inputs. Fortunately, not every input to a driver changes its state. For example, in a network driver, when you ask it to send a packet, the fact that it sends a particular packet has no impact on how it sends the next packet. So we don't need to record the contents of every packet. What we do need to record, however, are things like configuration operations that change how the driver processes things. Suppose you change a network driver from 100 megabit mode to gigabit mode. We need to record that so we can replay it for recovery. We also need to record... Responses from the driver, too. Sorry, my voice is bad, too. Are you seeing the responses from the driver as well? Yes, we see both. I, I took the slide out for clarity. So, um, yeah, we see everything in both directions. And instead, I interrupt you making talk about it instead. Okay. Yes. So we have to record configuration operations. We also have to record connection operations when you're opening a connection or configuring a connection so we can reestablish connections. Um, and finally, we need, to do, we need to record all the outstanding requests that have been submitted to the driver but have not yet been processed. So we can handle those appropriately after a failure. And this makes sure that if, if a driver fails, we don't actually lose any of these requests and we can do something appropriate um, during the recovery process. Do you, does the shadow driver actually have to shadow all of the data as well? It does not shadow the data. It basically keeps a pointer. It, it, it copies data that it need, that's not stored anywhere else. So for configuration operations, it'll actually store the configuration data. For example, it'll store if you send in an IOCTL and there's some data payload in the IOCTL that configures the driver a certain way, it'll store that payload from the IOCTL. In the case of restoring requests, though, the kernel already knows about requests in general because the kernel knows about this ERP. So we just store a pointer to the existing ERP. Or in Linux, it's storing to the existing socket, socket buffer structure or um, block header for block devices. So driver-specific cues are lost, though. Anything internal to the driver is lost. But if the kernel, the kernel, the, the, like in Linux, the, block, the kernel has a queue of requests that it's submitting to the block driver. Um, and we reuse that queue to keep back of the outstanding requests. If the, kernel, if the driver had its own internal queue, then we would have to maintain a separate queue of requests that had submitted, been submitted to the driver and add things to that queue whenever it's given to the driver and take it out of the queue whenever the driver completes it or cancels it or does something like that. Do you need like more that. visibility into the driver internal operations? We don't need visibility in the internal operations, but we need to understand the protocol between the kernel and the driver. So if the kernel hands a request off to the driver, mm -hmm. we need to know the driver is now responsible for it. Yeah. And when the driver completes it or says, I'm done with it now, I'm not going to do anything else, then we take it out. <laughs> And we just need to record that it's currently the driver's job to be working on this request. So I was going to ask you that question. So is it always clear that when a device driver has finished a servicing an operation? In Linux, it is clear. For example, with a sending a packet, the, the, kernel, the driver will tell the kernel, I'm done with this request. And the reason it needs to be clear is so the kernel can then reuse that data structure. Because if it's not clear, the kernel can never garbage collect or free that thing. And so in general, all the examples I've looked at, it's very clear when the driver's done with it. But there might be a crash in between when it changes the state of hardware and when it notifies the kernel. Yes, so yes. So the, you right. do the same thing twice. Right. right. So right. definitely there's an issue where we don't know at the time of failure what the state of the outside world is. We know what the kernel thinks the state is, and then there's an ambiguity of what happened to this particular request. Was it, did it go out before the failure or did it not go out? Um, and that's a case that I'll talk about in a minute where we have to decide during the recovery process how to handle those things. So, oh. Okay. Did you ever have a case where, say, you had a, a disk driver that was doing some kind of reordering of the packets? I mean, reorder of this, the sends because uh, reads and writes because it was doing some elevator algorithm, or whatever. Right. And it's got its own internal queue of how all that's managing. Is that considered internal state? That's uh, the, the order of operations is considered internal state. In Linux, it turns out that the the, L, the ordering algorithm is, expli is, is made explicit to the kernel. The kernel maintains the queue, and the driver provides the elevate the function for scheduling within the queue. So the kernel, the driver can change the order of things, but it has to tell the kernel what the new order is. Um, I don't. The disk itself doesn't actually have to follow the order, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but the driver has this particular order. Um, Galen, right? So, so I think you have one tap in the entire system. If, and well, then one, one tap each function effectively. Okay, and then, right. But the, the tap system is per OS. The shadow drivers are per class. Per class of drivers. Okay. Yeah.
one quick question about um, <clears throat> when you're storing IO controls, you have that same problem not knowing how big they are, don't you? Because they don't. Uh, we know. Well, we know if the if the protocol to the driver is known, that if there's a standard interface to a sound card driver, that interface will say these are the octals. This is what the data looks like, and so we can use that to know how big the octal data is. If you have a user mode component that ships with that driver that has that uses the octals that are not published anywhere else, we do not know how big the octal data is. Now, fortunately, in Linux, the encoding of octals the actual number encodes the direction of the octal, if it's a read or write or read-write, or rather in-out, in or both. It also encodes whether it's a, uh, whether it is a, uh, how big the data type, how big the data is. Yeah, and so we can leverage that. But in Windows, that's not the case. They're not all encoded, unfortunately. Right, right. So, so I don't rely on that. It's sort of a hint um, for protocol, for drivers where that is enforced. Okay. But otherwise, you would need to basically sit down with the spec for the driver interface and, yeah. and implement the functionality for the actuals. In the okay. It seems like in principle, if you had a weird enough driver um, that you could have successive config commands that would be like changing its state a little bit, like taking the voltage of this and changing the you know, bit rate of that, um, so that such that you have to kind of from the from the moment that that driver became active when the system booted or what you have to until the time that it actually failed you have to keep a record of of every possible or every config that was ever sent to right it. Is that right that's possible the drivers that I've worked with found that that's not the case commonly typically you basically have parameters and you're configuring parameters and so you just need to record at the time of failure what was the latest value of these parameters the other thing is that if you think about a typical system there's not that much driver configuration changing driver configuration that goes on. Um, and so what I found is the size of the state we're actually logging is really pretty small, a couple hundred bytes. Uh, but again, it is dependent, you know, this is, to some extent there's a bias here because I work with drivers that I understand and I know this will work for, and I didn't try to implement it for drivers for which it would be impossible. And so my experience is all with things where it worked. Um, <laughs> I didn't do a video graphics card. We looked at doing graphics cards. The problem in Linux is that graphics drivers have this, have this structure where there's a kernel mode component and a user mode component. And I believe that many of the failures are in the user mode component. And the problem in Windows is that the user mode component runs in the X server, and it kills the X server, which is the parent of all running processes, so it kills all programs. So it's effective to rebooting your system, but it's in user mode. Um, and so you could re-implement this, I think, at, the, at a user mode level and get the similar kinds of benefits, because uh, that's where the standardized interface is. So there's a question about reordering disk operations. And this is actually something I think Alec brought up when I was at OSDI. What happens if you have if you have sort of reads and writes to the same block on disk and you have a failure and you try to replay things, um, how do you handle operations like that? Mm -hmm. um, and in thinking about it, I think there's a couple things we can do. One thing we can do is, at least in Linux, what I found is that you typically, if there's a read from a block that's just written, the kernel will not actually do the read if it has the memory and data because it's about to write to it. So you don't have read after write of the same block. Um, and so you don't have a problem with those being, uh, with not knowing if the write happened first or not, which handles one of those problems. Um, it's a, you know, why don't we, th we'll talk about this later. If they're in the driver simultaneously, then, then most likely any order is okay anyway, so. Well, there's an issue if you have reads and writes and you don't know what happened, then you have a read and then you have a write after it. Um, if you just resubmit them, if you don't know that the write completed and you resubmit the read, it may read the updated data instead of the old data. So they were in the driver at the same time. Right, but the right. kernel expect, the kernel gave the order to the driver saying this read is supposed to go before this write. So, yeah, that only matters if you assume that the device itself can't reorder them, which typically they can. Right. So, so in any in any case, we we I did, worry about it. We were we were we were very worried about this. Um, and we actually did a huge set of fault injection experiments with a disk driver, about 2,000 experiments, to see would we see any corruption from this kind of thing. And so we actually ran an FSCK after every time, and we didn't see it. It doesn't mean it couldn't happen. We think that those kinds of problems are fairly unlikely, um, at least from our test data. What but file system were you using? What? What file system were you using? Um, we were using ext 3 I think. So we would have detected a journal. The what? journaling. Okay, but it's not reading the journal. It's just writing it, so you, you, you wouldn't see that there at all. Um, anyway, let me move on. Uh, unless there's more questions here. <coughs> okay. So, as I said, we log the config stuff. So what happens when a driver fails? Well, we can detect the driver failed in one of three ways. First of all, we can detect it from the processor. If it detects a memory access violation, the, it'll raise an exception. The kernel's exception handlers will notify the shadow driver that a driver was executing, had an exception, and it should be recovered. 
We can also detect it in the wrappers if the, if the, app, if the sorry, we can detect the failure in the wrappers if the driver passes a bad parameter to the kernel. We can also detect limited other kinds of resource consumption problems, for example, allocating too much memory or using too much CPU in certain cases. We can detect that as well. And again, we can trigger the recovery process. Now, this does not detect all possible ways a driver can fail. You know, a disk driver could fail by writing blocks to the wrong place on disk, or a network driver could fail by sending half the bytes in every packet. We can't detect that. So we have an interface where an external agent could detect, could tell us that a driver has failed. And you can imagine in Windows this might be, you know, the little red X in the top of application windows could signal, you know what, I think something's going on here. You should look more carefully, potentially trigger, you know, detect that a driver has not completed a request and trigger recovery. So once we know that the driver failed, the first thing the shadow does is immediately sever communication between the driver and the kernel by changing how the tap operates. In this recovery mode, the tap does not allow the kernel and the driver to communicate at all. Instead, all communication is sent just to the shadow driver. The shadow is responsible for answering all requests. The next thing the shadow does is to, is to garbage collect the, thing, the kernel objects the driver was using, walking through the object table, and then reset the driver to the state it was in when it was just loaded off disk but not yet initialized. Now, it does this by reusing the driver's existing text section in memory, all of its code, and it copies back the initial data section, all the global variables. Um, the dri shadow driver stores this when a driver is first loaded so that it doesn't have to go back to disk during the recovery process. So at this point, the driver's in the state as if it's just loaded but not yet initialized. So the shadow then repeats the sequence of calls the kernel made when initializing this driver. For example, calling a driver's initialization routine. Then the driver gets called like this. It may try to invoke the kernel to request resources or register as a driver. We don't want the kernel to see these calls because it thinks the driver is still running. It'll get confused if the driver registers again. So the tap sends these calls to the shadow, and the shadow's job is to respond as if it was the kernel. Now, the other thing the shadow can do here is to update the existing kernel objects to, that reference the old driver and make them reference the new incarnation of the driver instead. Um, so we can sort of integrate the new driver into the system this way. Now, after this point, the driver's in the state as if it's initialized, but nobody's using it. So the final step of recovering here is to replay the log. For example, replaying configuration requests, reopening connections, and here, dealing with any requests that are outstanding at the time of failure. And here's where we need to decide, can we replay a request or not? And we really try to leverage the properties of the device. So for example, in a network device, we know we can deliver, we can duplicate packets. And so we can resubmit packets that we're, we don't know the status of. Similarly, with a, with a disk, we can often resubmit disk requests because you can read the same block multiple times or write the same block multiple times and get the same outcome. Um, in other drivers, you might choose to do different things. In a sound card driver, for example, you might choose to just drop the sound that you're playing, drop a sample here or there, or you might choose to duplicate it instead. Um, and it's kind of up to the semantics um, of the application or of the driver class. So in summary, the shadow driver recovers by resetting the driver, reinitializing the driver, and then replaying all the logged requests <coughs> in the back. What might you do for a video driver? For a video driver, what I would do is actually rely on the fact that in many cases, you can tell applications that their video driver has gone away and is coming back. Um, and so I think ATI already has the technology to restart their driver dynamically. Um, and what I would do is leverage the, the rest of the system to do the recovery. So you know, currently, if you have a screensaver running, if you start a screensaver and come back from screensaver, all the applications put their stuff up again. And so rather than storing all the driver state in the shadow driver, I would rely on the existing techniques to make the application regenerate that state so that very, very little needs to be stored by the driver itself. And you can think about changing video modes as similar. In Windows, this is, in Linux, this isn't possible to the same extent because you can't dynamically change video modes. Um, but in Windows, I think something like that should work. I don't have any idea how it works, but Windows currently will recover the, the, the video driver. I've got a bad driver on one of my machines and it crashes. Right. Now, I think if you're running like a, a, a 3D video game or something that's doing a lot of 3D rendering, it may not work as well because you may lose all your texture mappings and things like that. And it's true, you may have to kill the application that is using it at that time. But the rest of the system hopefully will keep running. I, anyway. I think it even works. Yeah. It will actually tell you who lost what? your device. Isn't that what causes the drivers to crash? Uh, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> so let's, the other part of recovery, remember, is how do we spoof, is spoofing applications into thinking that the driver is still available? And in doing this, the shadow driver is really acting as an approximation of a driver because it's trying to answer requests on the driver's behalf. This is kind of like this. Yes. How important is this? I mean, it really depends on how long it takes to recover the device driver, right? Right. Well, it depends on, on what the. You, it's definitely important to conceal the failure. And the question is, how important is spoofing as a way of, is actually responding to requests as a way of concealing failure? I mean, if the recovery is instantaneous, then It's not instantaneous, though. And the reason it's not instantaneous is that hardware can take a long, drivers can take a long time to initialize it. It can take up to about five seconds or so. Um, and so, 
Um, you know, the, one of the network cards I'm working with takes five seconds. The IDE drive I'm working with, ID driver takes about five seconds because it's probing all the hardware. So without support from the driver and modifying the driver to skip those pieces, it can take a while. The sound card driver is pretty fast. It takes about a little less than a tenth of a second. Um, but the point is, is that you need to make sure applications don't see failures. And if you have a hang for five seconds, that's something that people see and understand and might start getting concerned about. And the real goal here is to keep applications live and responsive while recovery is happening. Um, and not necessarily making forward progress, but at least, at least keep users happy. Uh -huh. So the shadow driver here is acting as an approximation of a driver. Similarly, the way a small spare tire in modern cars is an approximation of a tire. The tire is good enough to get you across town to a repair shop, but it's not good enough to get you across the country. Similarly, a shadow driver is good enough to keep you running, keep you running while the driver is recovering, but it's not going to keep you running for very long because it can't actually control the hardware. Um, and so what happens is that when the kernel would normally call into the driver, the tap sends that call to the shadow. The shadow then has to respond as if it was the driver. And the goal is really to put off the application in some way. That the application is happy and understands this is a valid thing to do, um, but doesn't get too confused and doesn't get concerned that the driver has actually failed. So in doing this, you know, the big, the big problem here is, as I said before, is the shadow driver is generic. It can't actually control the device. So it has to use totally generic methods to respond to requests. And we found there are five general strategies that the writer of a shadow driver can use to respond to requests. And the choice of method really depends on the the semantics of the particular driver class and the re particular request to the driver. So the best thing that a shadow driver can do is to respond exactly the same way the real driver would do. And this can be done, for example, when an application is querying configuration information the shadow has in its log. In this case, the shadow can just return the information from its log, returning the same exact data the real driver would return, and the application goes on as it would have. Now, this isn't always possible, but another thing shadow the drivers that shadow drivers can do, sorry, is to act busy. So a lot of drivers are limited by the data rate they can give out to the real world. If you, if you try to give it more data than it can pass to the real world or read more data than it can read from the real world, it'll tell you, I'm busy, I can't satisfy this right now. And so a shadow driver can use this to basically tell applications of the operating system, you know, I'm too busy right now, I can't take requests. So we do this in the network shadow driver where we just tell the kernel that our queues are full and we can't take packets right now and we'll get back to you. And this allows applications to very happily block within the socket code in the kernel and not actually see that anything has failed. And this doesn't work because not every interface has this kind of ability to block callers. So if you're querying information or setting configuration information, you can't actually block that because it's not rate limited by the outside world. But something else you can do is to just block the caller yourself. And so in some cases, we can suspend the caller on an internal wait queue and then resume them when the driver is recovered. And the final two things we can do for callers that can't be blocked, such as interrupt handlers, um, we can queue these requests to be handled later when the driver recovers, or we can just drop the request and rely on the semantics of the request to make sure this is a safe thing to do. Using these five general strategies, we can ensure that the application in the OS can keep running in the presence of a driver failure and not be where the driver has failed. Yes? Uh, those, those cover the space. You can always do one of those. You never get to the state where you can't satisfy a request you can't block it. There, there are, what we found, we, I can't say across all drivers everywhere this would cover the, this would cover the space. We found that this covered the space. And in fact, the majority of the time, we are either blocking or acting busy. Um, the other ones are sort of extreme cases. You know, the, the place where you have run into problems is if you have a driver, an application that depends on real-time response from a driver. The driver's not there. We can't do real-time response. And that's something we can't mask because we just can't provide that level of service. Um, and so this happens in the case of, an, of like a sound application of real-time streaming data where we have to figure out what do we do the fact that there's no data available here. Um, and there's, there's something else you could do, which is to give back fake data. You know, you could return a buffer full of zeros when you try to read data. Um, and we concluded that was sort of ultimately a bad idea because we couldn't really reason about what the application was doing with the data. And so this seemed like the set of, of safe things we could do that would not substantially change the behavior of the application. Actually, yeah. that seems like a great thing to do for the sound card input. Right? I mean, it just sounds like the room got quiet for a couple seconds. It mm -hmm. seems like you could reason pretty well about that for um, certain devices. Uh, you know, in general, I think returning data, it depends on if we know what the sound card is recording, how it interprets. So suppose you're doing some kind of anomaly detection, you actually <coughs> depend on not having zeros. Then getting a whole bunch of zeros will actually trigger some big response you didn't want. And you're better off just sort of not returning anything and blocking the caller until you get more data. Um, and so it, it, and there's definitely cases where it is the right thing, but it's hard to reason generally. And we have some configuration parameters that I don't like to use where you can sort of say, this application wants to block, this one wants to just drop data. So you can configure it that way, but really I'm opposed to configuration in general, so I don't expose it. 
Yes. So, so one thing, how much of this do you think should actually be exposed to the applications that their driver could fail? I think there's something you're kind of trying to hide this. And I right. For fault tolerant applications, I would actually want to know. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, th I think you should be able to register and say, I want to know about failures. Kind of like uh, scheduling activations and scheduling, where if you, if you know about these things, you should want to tolerate it because you know best on what the response should be. If you don't know anything about it, though, then we don't want to force it on you, force you to do something you're not prepared for. I mean, this is always, I think, a general problem when you're trying to do fault tolerance. What do you actually mask? Because you may, if you, find, if you don't know enough about the application, you may actually make things worse by masking it. And so we're trying to find a balance where generally things get better, um, but that we can expose additional information for people who really care. In all the applications I tested, about 14 applications, only one of them actually did any error checking and recovery. And it was written by a bunch of academics in England, which I think is kind of a, a separate set of developers from the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> Anyway, because so. Because they're in England or because they're academics? Both. both. <laughs> <laughs> a combination, I think. Uh, it was in Edinburgh. We can trust the Oh, well, they weren't even in England. That's true. Sorry, in Britain. <laughs> in Britain. So, once recovery is completed, the shadow driver uh, tells the tap that things are, are good again. And again, calls from the kernel, go to both the device driver and the shadow, and your system keeps running once again. So, in summary, Nux provides isolation using lightweight kernel protection domains, extension procedure call to transfer control an object table to track the object in use by driver, wrappers to make this all transparent, does recovery using shadow drivers that conceals the failure from applications, and then resets the driver state to what it was in at the time of failure. Now at this point I want to stop talking about design and start talking about how we evaluated this. First of all in terms of the size of the implementation, then in terms of the benefit of using Nooks, and then the cost of using Nooks in terms of performance. So let's start off with the evaluation, I, the implementation. I implemented this in the Linux 2.4.18 kernel, and I tested it with three classes of drivers, sound card drivers, network drivers, and MPD storage drivers. And across these three classes, I tested with 14 different drivers. And what we found was that in almost every case, once we implemented the shadow driver for one instance of a driver class, it just worked for the other instances, demonstrating that there really is a common interface between drivers. We did run into two specific problems, however. There was one network driver that could not be restarted dynamically. You had to reboot your system to restart the driver. And in that case, we couldn't reset, we couldn't recover. Another case was a, set, was a network driver that had a dependency where it wasn't actually initialized until a timer callback went off. And now normally in Linux, that callback went off between two calls, and it happened because it was a user mode tool that made one of the calls, and that tool, because it had to be loaded off disk and run, ran well after the timer interrupt went off. When we repeated the sequence of calls inline in the kernel, the Linux kernel is non-preemptive, and so the, all those calls went straight through. The timer, interrupt came, the timer callback came back late at the wrong time, and the driver never got initialized. So we had to put in some fancy code to handle that. Um, and so if you have sort of hidden dependencies on the exact sequence of calls from the kernel, we can run into problems. Alec? Of the 81 drivers that are running on your laptop, how many different classes of drivers are there? Um, I think, I don't know offhand. I would guess uh, a dozen, two dozen. Um, there's quite a few sort of, you know, different kinds of buses internally. There's a lot of different networking devices. There's a lot of different human input devices. Um, and I think some of these are sort of multiple part drivers that you can sort of say really are, are two halves of the same driver in different pieces. But I don't have that data, unfortunately. It's kind of hard to look just at the names of everything and figure out what class it's in. Um, so in terms of the implementation, we break the code down in two ways. First of all, we looked at what did we have to do to the existing code. Out of the 1.1 million lines of code in the Linux kernel, not counting device drivers, we had to change 924 lines, or a little less than one-tenth of one percent, demonstrating you really can integrate a subsystem like this without large-scale changes to the kernel. Out of the 50,000 lines in those 14 device drivers, we didn't have to change any code. We did have to recompile them, however, but still, this, is a good, this means we really can do this for existing unmodified code. We also have to look at the new code I had to write. For isolation, I had to write about 23,000 lines of code, and the bulk of this is in the wrappers that actually does the data copying. And for the recovery, it's about 3,300 lines of code. Now, this is only for three classes of drivers, so it's important to look at how much code would be necessary to add another class of drivers. So we separated out the code unique to each of these classes of drivers, and we found that it ranges between 200 and 700 lines of code. In comparison, a single driver that we're testing with ranges between 5,000 and 14,000 lines of code, many times larger and more complex than a shadow driver. Now, a shadow driver, though, is a class driver, meaning that it works for any driver in the class. And so we also looked at how big are these classes and how many, dri how, much, how many drivers are there and how much code is there. And here we get between 8 and 190 drivers in these classes, between 29,000 and 264,000 lines of code. For example, for the network class, 198 line shadow driver can recover from the failure of 190 different drivers 
comprising over 264,000 lines of code. This demonstrates the tremendous leverage that we can get from taking a class-based approach to providing recovery. How many classes are there in Linux? How many classes in Linux? So there are three major classes. There's, there's character <coughs> devices, block devices, and network devices. Um, within each of those, there are minor classes. So there are sort of human input um, character devices. I don't have the total number on the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, looking at Windows, uh, there's a, there's a slide at WinHack that broke Windows down into about 20 different classes, major classes of drivers with different interfaces. <clears throat> but if you think about how big, the, how big the Windows group is and how much code there is, then it's not a tremendous amount of additional code um, beyond supporting those drivers today. So the next thing I want to talk about is what is the benefit of using Nooks in terms of reliability? So we'll start off by looking at what does Nooks do for system, to prevent system crashes. And what we want to do is take a system with Nooks and without Nooks, subject it to the same exact set of failures, and see how do the two systems respond. Ideally, we do this with 1,000 different drivers, with 1,000 bugs in each driver, and we'd have a huge amount of data on what actually happens. Practically speaking, though, that's very difficult because driver bugs may not happen all the time, so you'd need to run for a million years for that to happen. And it's also very hard to run 1,000 drivers because you actually need 1,000 cards, and you need to swap everything in and out. So we got around this by using only five drivers <coughs> and by using synthetic fault injection to inject artificial bugs into the driver. What we do is we load a driver into memory and we then inject bugs into the driver by modifying the driver's code in memory. We use a tool that was written to the University of Michigan to study file system corruption that injects artificial bugs that, mo that model realistic programming errors. For example, it'll model a, a uh, bad parameter error by changing the data that gets pushed on a stack before a procedure call. Now, the, dis the, the actual types of errors were taken from a study done at IBM of failure of why the MVS operating system crashed around 1991 or so. And unfortunately, I don't actually have data on the distribution of why drivers fail. Microsoft may have that, but um, they haven't been willing to tell me. So instead, I use a uniform distribution across my 10 or 12 different kinds of failures that I can inject. Um, and so what that means is that these tests will not give you the sense of exactly what would happen in the real world, but they give you a better sense of coverage. You know, how, how, how effective is this at a broad class of bugs? You can't actually say, this will make your system X percent more reliable. So we inject the bugs into the system. We then test it to see what happened. Now, without Nooks, there's two possible outcomes. Either nothing can happen because the bug didn't get executed or executed but had no impact, or the system can fail in some way, for example, crashing and hanging. With Nooks, there's a third possibility, which is that the system can detect a failure and then recover. We then reboot the system and do this about 350 times for each driver. Now, what we would expect to see is that on a system with Nooks, the failure cases that occurred without Nooks will become recovery cases. So let's look at the outcomes. So on this graph, I'm going to show you the names of the drivers we tested with on the x-axis, and on the y-axis are the number of times the system crashed or hung. In blue are the results without Nooks, and in red will be the results with Nooks. If Nooks had no impact whatsoever, the red and the blue bars would be the same height. So what we see with the PCNet 32 100 megabit driver, we had 119 crashes without Nooks out of the 350 failures we injected. With Nooks, we had zero. The E1000 gigabit Ethernet driver had 52 crashes without Nooks. With Nooks, it had zero. IDE disk driver, 152 crashes without Nooks, zero crashes with Nooks. Now, lest you be getting bored with the Sound Blaster driver, we did yeah. see that, lo and behold, Nooks was not able to recover. And the problem here was really one of fault detection. The driver went into an infinite loop, and we couldn't detect that the driver had failed, and so we couldn't recover the system. Overall, though, Nooks was able to recover from more than 99% from more than 99 of the cases where the system crashed without Nooks, meaning that it really, we think, can have an impact on preventing system crashes. Now, the second aspect of this is recovery. What happens to applications when a driver fails? We did a very similar set of experiments. This time, we ran a couple of different applications um, for each driver. We just used one driver from each class in this case. And we saw, we wanted to see what happens to the application when a driver fails. Um, and so in this graph, I'm going to show you the, along the x-axis are the names of the application. Along the y-axis are what was the outcome? How many failures did we see? In blue will be the number of times the driver failed, and in red are the number of times the application <coughs> subsequently failed, meaning that it did not produce the same output to some extent. So if you have an application that hangs for a while and then keeps running and produces the same output, we consider that a success. If it runs, if it hangs and then it never comes back, that's a failure. Um, so what we see, the drivers failed quite a few times. Um, it varies a little bit across across the different drivers and applications. The applications, however, were able to keep running in 98% of the cases when the driver failed. Now, the reasons that it didn't succeed were similar to what we saw before. In the case of the MP3 player and the remote copy program, the driver went into an infinite loop, and we couldn't regain control of the system to trigger recovery because interrupts were disabled. Yes? So do you not get loops from replaying, from putting the device back into the same state and presenting the same data that potentially? So in this case, um, in these experiments, when we reload the driver, we take the bug out. 
Because these bugs are deterministic bugs that occur every time you execute the code. And the reason we needed to do that is that it's sort of impractical to have non-reproducible failures and have them execute in within a finite amount of time. We actually tried some things where we had bugs that would sort of happen one out of every 10 times you invoke them, but we didn't think the results were actually meaningful. Right. Um, we, we did do. Deployment case. And I just wonder. Yeah, you know, we. Don't, I, I guess we just don't know what fraction of bugs are right. non right. We do. We do. Uh, we have thought a lot about what happens if you have a bug that does reoccur every time you restart the driver. And there's two things we do about that. One thing is we have another. We have a separate policy agent that can run that can say, you know what, if you're restarting three times in 10 minutes, chances are it's not going to work the next time. So you shouldn't restart anymore. You should just, you just, just unload the driver and be done with it. Don't bother restarting it. Just say that it's failed and not do anymore. The other thing, though, is that if you, get this, if you get a place where you recover and the same failure happens during recovery, we actually now have a very, very nice reproduction scenario. We can say, this driver fails when you do these exact operations so with these exact parameters, making it very easy to go and subsequently debug and see exactly what happened. And so in that case, I think we still provide a lot of value in finding reproduction scenarios for hard to find bugs. Um, so the other case here, why things failed, in the case of the compiler in the database, what we found is that the driver had passed bad data into the kernel that we didn't detect. And then even when we recovered the driver, the kernel was not able to issue any more disk requests. Um, and as a result, the system crashed because it couldn't do any paging. So this is a case where additional parameter checking inside the wrappers would have a lot of benefit. Um, but to some extent, to know exactly how much error checking to put in takes a lot more knowledge to know exactly what kinds of failures are you seeing and put in checks for the likely failures. And we tried to take sort of a simpler approach of having a very simple set of checks. Overall, though, as I said before, Nooks was able to recover from 98% of the cases where the driver failed. So the last question is really, what is the cost of doing this? Is this something that's going to really slow you down too much to be practical? Ideally, we'd want something that's at 100%, so there's no cost of doing it. Now, that's not practical because this, you know, I told you I was adding, 3, 000, I was adding a, lot of, a lot of expense to every invocation of a driver. Um, to measure performance, what we did was measure the performance of common applications across these three classes of drivers. And we measured the relative performance between a system without Nooks and a system with Nooks. So without Nooks, this is relative performance. Everything's at 100%. With Nooks, what we found is that performance was at worst 3% below what it was without Nooks. And on average, it was within about 1%. And the reason for this is that using drivers is a very small amount of what most applications do. Most of what they're doing is user interface. It's more you know, in doing computations, things like that. The actual I.O. piece of talking to, drive, to, to, to the device is a very small piece. Now, we did, however, see when we, this is, let me back up. This performance here is looking at sort of high-level metrics, such as throughput for the network or elapsed time to compute a workload for the, for the storage driver. If you look just at CPU utilization, though, you do see more overhead. So this is the CPU utilization when running these tests. And you can see, in the case of the network send test, that the CPU utilization does jump dramatically. And the reason is that every time you send a packet, we're adding about 3,000 cycles to actually do the XPC into the driver. Um, and because you need to do this on every packet, there's no batching that goes on. We pay a lot of cost. The reason it didn't impact performance is that the, the, the device has an internal queue. So this cost is being overlapped with the actual sending of packets. And so it doesn't come out of the overall application performance. If your application is running with the CPU fully utilized, you would see the performance go down. Um, but to some extent, this is a benefit you can get back if you have a faster processor or you have another processor you can do application work on while you're doing I.O. This is a gigabit network. So this is about 70,000 packets per second that we're sending. Um, and I think if you rewrote the, the, the loop in the kernel that sends packets, we could drop this by about 80, we could drop the overhead by 80% because we could amortize the cost of invoking the driver, yes. Do you see any potential of like, well, something like a network send is happening <coughs> so often. I mean, so the same calls are happening all the time. Do you have any, uh, whereas something like a sound driver going into, you know, 19.2 uh, sampling rate might be really weird and happen only once in a rare while. So mm -hmm. do you think there's any possibility of being able to watch forever over a period of time and say like, okay, I believe this guy is safe because it's done one million, you know, calls of this type under all kinds of parameter settings and seems to not have failed. If you see, so, so then you could get rid of this overhead for. Definitely, users. I actually since uh, doing this work, we implement a system where you can choose. There's a flag that says, should I actually change page tables when invoking the driver? Should I just do the stuff necessary for recovery? And so you can turn off changing page tables, which gets you a lot of the performance back. And so if you have confidence in a driver, you could sort of turn it off. And if the failure did not actually cause any kernel corruption, you can still recover, but you're paying a much lower cost to invoke the driver. Is that the, you're, you're the one, or your system knows this, but it's the one who will really be able to have the confidence or not. I think, I think, 
what you could do is you could decide the send packet operation is one that I trust, and really I want to look at, I want, really want to protect the octal operations or some other operation where I know the things fail. The problem is actually you need to have enough information to know what is the call that leads to failure. And unless you have a lot of failures, I mean, nobody's system crashes every 10 minutes unless you're a developer. But if your, crash, if your system crashes once every two weeks, there's really not enough data. I mean, there's a year between before you get 25 data points. That's right. And it's hard to get enough information to know what that is. To, you're trying to catch very rare events, you know, one in a trillion or something like that. Then it makes it a very hard learning problem. So I'm not sure that learning that dynamic would be practical. I should speed up because I have, you know, like no time left. <coughs> uh, okay, this is equalization. So in summary, in building Nooks, identified some properties of drivers that enable them to be isolated in recovery. In particular, this, the pattern of communication and the way that they manage state makes them amenable to automated recovery. Um, in developing Nooks, I developed an architecture and some components and techniques for improving system reliability that I think could be applied to other areas beyond drivers, other extensible systems. In our experiments, I demonstrated that Nooks could prevent 99% <coughs> of the crashes that occurred under native Linux and keep applications running in 98% of the time. And furthermore, if you look at the size of our implementation, it's a very small amount of code that we're, we're adding to your system to make it tolerate failures in a much larger body of code, um, which gives you a huge amount of leverage in improving system reliability. Before I conclude, I want to give credit to people who have done related work. There's been people doing a lot of related work. Um, <laughs> if you have any questions, I can, I can answer them. But uh, you know, there's some work that's been done here at the bottom. Um, people have done all kinds of stuff. I should probably credit Galen for doing work on driver reliability, and Rich Draves did work on online upgrading of kernel components um, in 97 or so in a Hotwise paper. So in conclusion, in working in this project, I've tried to take a structural approach to improving reliability, where I'm adding new structures into the operating system to make it tolerate the failure of a like, large body of existing code. And in the future, I'd like to take a similar approach, um, sort of a structural approach to other problems, in particular looking at reliability for extensible systems, one thing that I've developed by looking at this is a sense of what is it about a body of code that makes it, that makes it uh, feasible to do automated isolation and recovery like this. And so I'm interested in finding other application domains and also developing tools to mine a body of code and see is this something, are there properties of this code that we can rely on to do automated, automatic recovery. I'm also interested in looking at security and configuration. When I was at Microsoft, I worked in the Windows group and we did all these great mechanisms for security and none of them got used because it was just too hard to figure out the policy. No one could understand how to use these very, very fine-grained mechanisms. And so I'm really interested here in developing tools for developers to use to let them understand their applications better, allowing them to then sort of automatically develop security policies for the applications and also to understand how they interact with the system in terms of configuration data so they can do a much better job of automatically adapting to their environment or adapting to user needs in terms of configuring themselves. And then finally, I'm interested in sort of tackling the problem of operating system complexity. And I think this is something near and dear to the people working in Singularity. Um, the, the existing operating systems we have are these huge beasts that are very complex. And that complexity really limits our ability to do interesting things. You know, to do a new file system or new network protocol is a huge amount of work. Um, and so I'm interested in how can we sort of get from where we are today to a place where these things are much easier to understand and to build um, and to work with. So thank you all for coming. And at this point, if there's anybody left to take question, ask questions, I will take questions. We should be nice to you because you're a father. <laughs> she was born about three weeks before the Shadow Driver paper was due. So she gets the picture because I missed her first three weeks. Oh yes. Um, what do you think the likelihood is if any of this being accepted by the sort of main Linux kernel developers as part of the mainstream kernel? Um, I think it's a ways off. I think that I haven't approached them yet. Um, and what it would take is a lot of engineering and work on my part to really, you know, this is definitely prototype code. I think it would take a lot of engineering work to actually build something, you know, test it with a body of drivers, find a major customer to actually run with it for a while. I think it's possible, though. And I think that the nature of Linux being developed as sort of a main kernel with add-on patches makes it easier to, to deploy something like this because you don't actually need to be in the main line to be useful. I think the problem with doing this in Linux is that they have no they have no, very little interest in actually maintaining a stable kernel interface to drivers. And so they often will change, you know, what locks are held when you invoke a driver, what are the exact parameters. Because they assume all the code is, that's important is in the kernel, it's very hard to maintain code outside the kernel. And since this code really depends on the interface, if you change that interface, this code has to change. And so there's a shadow driver would be in a never-ending chase right, behind this. Right, however, it might be a force to say, you know, if you get it into the kernel, then then the sort of the existing process will take care of it, but it's sort of there's this never-ending game of catch-up to get up to that point. I mean, it's the same. It's the same issue with drivers themselves. Is that the driver that's in the kernel gets changed along right. with interfaces that change, and if you're maintaining it separately, then you've got to keep playing catch-up. Yeah. So. Um, and so I think it's 
I think it's possible, but I think, you know, I think it's similar to the chances of this being incorporated in Windows. <laughs> Any other questions?